Welcome everyone. Uh, today's topic, uh, we'll be talking about the flipped classroom and uh, it's good to have uh, some participants here in the live hangout to discuss uh, current thoughts and opinions on, on the topic. I know that I've been reading a lot here recently and uh, on blogs and different webinars, a lot of talk about the concept of uh, the flipped classroom. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's a pleasure here to be with uh, you all and uh, have uh, time to discuss kind of what your understanding of the flipped classroom is, uh, what it might look like in a practical setting in the English language learning classroom, and uh, any other thoughts about maybe why one would want to even consider flipping uh, the classroom. So welcome everyone uh, to today's discussion. Thank you for having me. Um, so we do have sort of a, an agenda here, and uh, we've got the first question up being, well, what is a flipped classroom? So, um, Dave, I don't know if you want to take this on to get us started here, what, uh, what your initial thoughts are when you think of this, the notion of uh, the flipped classroom. Well, yeah, well, um, my feeling is to take as broad a definition as possible. Um, and that really gives teachers, you know, the chance to to be doing a flipped classroom um, without having to be uh, so focused and using. So typically, you know, it's the Khan Academy model, um, where students do the heavy lifting and watch the teacher on a video instructing, and then they come to classroom and and what they used to do as homework they would do in the classroom where the teacher can actually give them some help and uh, answer their questions and be more of a facilitator. Um, but my, my feeling is um, we can take a more broad definition of that and really uh, think of the flipped classroom as um, taking the learning outside of the classroom um, and the teacher-led kind of um, focus where students are doing activities in a self-directed fashion and then when they come and spend time with the instructor, the instructor is being a coach <clears throat> and really kind of uh, addressing and working with students individually um, to help them in whatever problem areas you know um, they need. So I I'm not stuck on the model of it being a teacher creating videos and posting them and students watching the teacher. Um, it doesn't have to be just teacher uh, videos to me, the flipped classroom. It's just this notion of students learning outside of the classroom environment or in a lab and then also learning with the teacher as more of a mentor or facilitator. Okay. Um, ben, I don't know if you have Anything you'd like to add about Benjamin? I I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Ben. Would you like to add any any other ideas to that definition? Um, well, honestly, I'm just I've I've heard the term a few times, and I'm trying to, to get to grips with it. Um, I read a few of the articles that Dave posted on the on the EFL 2.0. Uh, blog, and what I've taken away from it is that, um, yeah, it seems to be flipping kind of the, the lecture and the homework part of the class, and one of the criticisms that I liked and found really valuable was that um, the, the teacher who, who flipped her class first found that what it really did was turn it from a teacher-focused class into a student-focused class and then it wasn't really about flipping it at all but kind of teaching students how to learn and making them want to learn um, instead of saying now you do this and you do this at home and you do this at home and then we will do some other thing in the class. Yeah, um, Rob, I don't know if... Uh... You you're muted yourself again. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Rob, would you like to add anything before I chime in. And Rob's muted. I think. Yeah, we still can't hear you, Rob. OK. 
Okay, we're Rob. But you let us know when uh, if you get your mic worked out there. It looks like your mic active. is active, but uh, for some reason we can't hear you. Yeah, and uh, there I, we go. I have, there you go. I have a uh, I have a my heater's on, and I don't. I prefer not to use a, a headset, and it's blowing. Is the noise bad? No, nope. no, nope, that's all right. Uh, so anyway, I think that uh, a, a good point has been brought out. I, I like some of the things that uh, Khan has done, but the execution of it uh, might not be so hot. Um, just to put things into context, I teach. I don't teach language. I teach international visiting students at a university, and I teach business uh, topics. Um, I teach those in 100% online with office hours using Google Hangouts. I also teach in face-to-face -face classrooms of uh, up to 35 people. Uh, I do like if it, it, I think this whole thing with the interpretation of flipped, uh, you know, it lacks definition. I can say that uh, my experiences so far, just limited in about six months or so, have been uh, fantastic. Uh, not just from my standpoint, it's very challenging to me because I have to work hard because the direction of the class might switch. Um, and but I, what I what I'm really inspired by is that the students seem to pick up uh, a tremendous amount of creativity on topic uh, in how they do things, and they seem highly engaged in it. Uh, much more so because they're available to use the tools. And I would say, in summary. Of, of you know what do I see it's not what I want to talk about it's what they want to talk about that's on topic and it's their meaning how they put the those things into context and then they have the ability to show me you know I think students have been disadvantaged because it's the instructor who has the power and the tools to show and to tell and to speak to but what I find on at least my modified form of a flip is that uh, the students have the skills from wherever they are, even mobily, to show me what this means to them and to show everyone else what this means to them. Yeah, and, and I think that's key, uh, you know, finding a modified form of a flipped classroom, because I think one of the things that really concerns me, I guess, or uh, is trying, when I, when I try to define a flipped classroom, most of the things that I read, uh, there's this component of the typical lecture being reversed or being changed with uh, with homework. Um, and I'm looking now at a definition here that was published by Educause back in 2012. And they define it as the flipped classroom is a pedagogical model in which the typical lecture and homework elements of the course are reversed. So the key concepts here being reversed are the typical lecture and the homework. Now. Feasibly, if you're asking, asking the students to look at videos outside of class, I mean, isn't that also homework? I mean, anything that's outside of the class, in my view at least, is some form of homework. Now, granted, it's a different type of homework, but I think, um, you know, I've read that the flipped classroom does away with homework and, you know, some other notions that I just wonder if it adds to the the dialogue here of really what we need to be talking about when we talk about flipped classroom. I agree that, you know, this changing of the teacher's roles are important. Taking more of a facilitative role, a coaching role is very important that the students should be more active in their own learning. But I think when we start looking and talking about the flipped classroom in terms of only being videos, and I, and I, I know David, you've alluded to this in your prior discussion here, is maybe it doesn't have to be the videos that are produced by the the uh, teacher that it can be any videos and and I would ask could it feasibly be any type of input that they obtain outside of class you know maybe it's not just videos maybe it's also you know uh, blogs and basically any other content that they happen to find outside of the classroom and so I think one of the questions then becomes well how much of this information or input that the students get outside of class is being either curated from the teacher of the course or how or should it just be any content that they happen to come across it's their responsibility to go out and find it 
and then that leads into other questions as well, are the students able to do this? So I, I'm throwing some, some things to talk about. I don't know if any of you want to address any of those issues. Uh, is, does this all fall under the label of quote-unquote flipped classroom? Um, well, I, I think that's going to be defined, Benjamin, myself, but um, just very quickly, one point I'd like to make is what students do outside the classroom, I don't think we should define it very strictly. We should define it by um, what, what activities are good for them to do outside of the, the classroom on their own. And that should be the low level kind of on the blooms taxonomy kind of things. Things that are rote, memorization, um, introductions to topics, um, things with general comprehension. When they get to the classroom and then they apply it, um, that's when the teacher should be around. And when they're synthesizing lots of things and really bringing things together, that's when they need the help of the teacher and the facilitator or whoever's there. So I think it's not the actual, you know, labeling of the activities that that's really important. It's um, what are the objectives of those activities. But would you agree, and this is to everyone, would you agree though that the our objective in general as an, as educators is to allow students to reach a point where they can interact on their on their own, and that. At, at some point, if we limit or if we just say that helping the students and facilitating them in a classroom activity, that would be the end goal, wouldn't it also, could we take that a step further and say, well, at some point, we should try to also incorporate activities outside the classroom that foster further engagement where they are communicating with others, whether it's within the class or outside the class, but that our involvement even becomes less, it becomes even lesser of a role uh, in their own, uh, you know, in their own development, in their own activities. Does that make sense? Well, if I may uh, contribute a little bit, I think that one of the things I read, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'll try and uh, share the, the link that I read it on, um, that uh, this teacher said, was that she um, she felt like once she kind of stepped away from providing all of the material uh, for the students, uh, she taught them how to evaluate the material that they found because there's there's so much information on the internet that you, you can't always rely on a teacher to, to give you what you need and to, to teach students how to find things and how to determine, okay, this is a, this is a good source or this is a bad source, uh, will go a long ways towards, um, towards what you were talking about, um, you know, kind of helping them rely on the teachers less and making them feel like more empowered. Okay, uh, Marilina, I don't know if you would like to add anything at this point. Welcome, by the way. I'm not sure if you have a mic today, but uh, if you do, feel free to jump right in. Uh, Rob, uh, any, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, on my flipped classrooms, they've become highly interactive. Uh, you know, I, it's more than just watch videos, that's for sure. And they're certainly curated, and I don't feel that I'm the best at everything. Uh, so I have them, uh, you know, there are some few, a few things that I've uh, sought out and found, and I, th I just think they're excellent on topic. Uh, you know, watch this. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that it's the best. It's just the best I've been able to find so far that's on topic. Uh, in addition to just watching videos, uh, you know, I have them uh, actually work on using the tools that are available to them. I have asked them to hang out with each other uh, live using this type of a format. Um, I have them actually participate and do some things with, let's say, uh, project management software. Um, I, um, you know, I, I guess I, I, I do several things. I've also found that it's very challenging uh, to me and very rewarding that I'm able to adapt to the needs of the students. My courses are not set up 
10 weeks in advance or you know for an advanced schedule uh, as far as I can go is a week at most and even then I might have to change so yeah it's more challenging for me but I think it, it's also more student centered that way it meets their needs I might have to speed up I might have to slow down uh, some of those language type things some people uh, have a greater uh, abilities there and so they fly right through it and uh, they have they understand that um, but other people prefer to watch it over and over a few times in order to understand that that's on the link on the topics supply chain management new product development business type courses and where that applies it would be things like I know Korean history and I'm taking a course in new product development I have or I'm an art major and you know those those little things whether they're valid or not the right brain left brain stuff you know it's kind of like well I've never been exposed to that but for those who have some experience they also uh, take the direction of the class so I'm not serving the, the class anymore I'm able to take it down to the individual <coughs> level and help those a little bit more especially in the face-to-face -face classroom where the you know those who have experience with it can share and they are more than willing to share as long as they understand that other person has some context you know they've done the homework they've read the Wikipedia article that I gave to them how do I know how do I do my assessments I use hot potatoes and have to fill in the blanks not that that's an excellent uh, methodology but at least I know that they all have a few vocabulary words, right or wrong, with Wikipedia. But at least they have the same words to work from. Okay, I'll throw out one, one uh, final question, at least for me, as as far as what is a flipped classroom, uh, based on kind of some of the comments that uh, that were being uh, addressed here today. So, the work that the students do outside the class, it seems to me that they can either you can it falls under two types of general categories one being just receiving input and the other alternative would be to participate in some form of activity uh, and we can you know discuss what type of activity that might be but one would be just the content itself just receiving the input and then another category might be some sort of interaction with that content do both of those categories fall under this definition of the flipped classroom Uh, Dave, I don't know if you. Want to oh, jump in. I I think so for sure. Um, and and again, I'm going to go back to my point. It's not exactly important what the students are doing, um, the form of what they're doing outside of the classroom. I think it's important that uh, what they're doing outside of the classroom is something that um, they can they can uh, understand easily and it's not too difficult and it's the heavy lifting the kind of work that that's you know kind of required in order to um, do some of the higher level activities that we should be doing in the classroom and putting all the knowledge together and synthesizing evaluating creating within our classroom um, but in order to do those higher level activities we have to um, do some heavy lifting in, in a self-directed fashion um, by either you know reading content or watching a video most likely with students or doing some simple activities that students can do and achieve on their own I don't think it's any it does any service for the teacher to put up difficult content to be done outside of the classroom because one of the problems that the flipped classroom was supposed to solve was this fact that students were going home to do homework and synthesize and um, do the work but they didn't understand it and there was nobody there to help them at home um, so by just putting challenging content <laughs> out for the students to do outside of the classroom uh, we're really not um, following the flipped model because the flipped model is supposed to solve that problem so I think we should be really kind of um, cautious about what we ask students to do outside of the classroom and also you know keep it low keep it simple 
keep it something every student can do and have success. If they're higher level student, they might not even have to do it. You know, they're, they're just somewhere else and that's great. Um, and you might, you know, give them other activities to do for, um, in that sense. But the other point um, to Rob, I think that's really important is whatever they do outside of the classroom should have an evaluative component and should be worth something for their mark, for their, for their classroom and be of value. Um, too often I see teachers just say, go do these activities offline. <clears throat> and it's really dysfunctional to do that because only 5% of the students will do it and, and it makes what, what you do in the classroom more difficult. I, I, think, I think your point, that's, to me, that's very similar to here, read chapters 2 and 3 and you never know whether they read chapters two and three, but you know, using little tools like hot potatoes and fill in the blanks, I know that they have. So, uh, and they also appreciate that they don't have to buy big textbooks anymore that they don't read. Right, and I'd also say just to the point, um, I always illustrate the flipped classroom usually with the the metaphor of remember when we had to read a book in class, and you took English in classroom. Um, you had to, before you went to the classroom, you had to read chapters one and two of To Kill a Mockingbird. And that was the flipped classroom. You had to do it outside of the classroom, and then when you came in the classroom, you weren't reading the book. You were actually, you know, talking about the issues and doing activities to kind of um, process all that um, reading that you, that you had done. So, you know, that, that was a flipped classroom approach. In, in my uh, modified, uh, I've watched con videos to see how that goes, and of course I fall asleep after the second video, highly, you know. And uh, so what I, the only way that I decided I could really learn personally was if I uh, took out a piece of paper while I was at home and duplicated what the other person was doing. And I found that, you know, even watching videos, I, I have to go through several things with that in a face-to-face -face classroom as well. What does this mean when you watch the video, and can you actually do it? So show me what you can do. If you understand, you know, if it's a math or a thing, you know, you draw it. Uh, show me, you know, use the tools that are available, the technology, if you'd like, or sit there and uh, explain the concepts to everybody else on the board, on a piece of paper, at your uh, at your desk with a laptop. That's a personal learning style. I can't learn just by watching something. It's like watching TV. I, I can't remember the names of the actors. You know, personal problem. Well, to Dave's point on assessment, I think uh, if students are doing activities, watching videos, and, and we want to try to assess that, it seems like everything that they do outside of class should enable them to do something else. And that something else probably is some sort of dynamic within the classroom that then would be evaluated. So um, perhaps it's not so much evaluating whether they did an activity outside of class or they watched a video, but more importantly, perhaps, what is their performance or how has their performance improved within the classroom and then evaluate that, that aspect. So for me, in a flipped classroom environment, the actual instruction and assessment piece really get blurred together. And so you have more uh, in, uh, formative types of assessments that are going on that really are linked to instruction and, and you've got this kind of reciprocal uh, complex dynamic that goes back and forth between those two in the classroom so that the students are getting the feedback that they need when they need it uh, as they are performing some sort of hopefully relevant meaningful uh, activity that's you know that's that would serve them well in, in the future I'm not I'm not sure if how others feel about assessment how how assessment really fits into the the notion of the flipped classroom. Marielina, I don't know if you have a mic, if you would like to speak. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, sorry for being late. I had some uh, connection problems. And uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> I, I've been reading a lot as I wrote to you in the post about this flipped part. And actually, this is a recommendation. There is also another um, national guidelines for teachers uh, to use this uh, reversed class or flipped class, but uh, almost no one knows what that is. 
and uh, I'm uh, I'm a teacher of English as a second language, and I was wondering uh, how can I apply to my classes. Uh, well, uh, I sort of started with my students' classes, and with, with regular this, I. Uh, for instance, if I'm introducing you uh, grammar structures, I think you like videos they can watch. And also give them quizzes that they have to do. Well, actually, it's not real. Well, it's quizzes, but it, they're done in Zondo, which is a game because my students are around young, they're 11. So they like this game thing. And so they can uh, watch the videos and then do the tests and see if they can uh, the work. The way they do it is they do not always watch the videos at home because not all of them have to connect. So sometimes they have to do it uh, also at school. And I'm starting in this way, but I'm not I'm sure if this is the right way to apply to the class. It was when I was interested in the and I was asking if some of you does it with a language class. Uh, Um, I, I don't teach professionally uh, language, but I do work with many different uh, language people, and this is the significant difference. And I'm not sure how you would assess this. I'm going to go get some coffee. I need some coffee. And they don't really need to look at me. They can look at me do things like this, and all of those other body language types of things that lets you know what's going on in their heads. So I'm going to get my coffee. Well, I think, uh, Mary Dana, you have a, a good point in that for a lot of the second language classes, the teachers really are an important source of information for the students and that they're there is already a, a real mix of a, you know, a, a presentation, if you want, or a lecture, or something like that, that the students kind of rely on, and the, you know, the, the lecture or the presentation, again, it's necessarily a reactive and adaptive, um, because we're constantly checking with the students, okay, yeah, these, these Okay, you you understand this part, but okay, now we move on to this part, or we slow down. So, it's not quite as simple as um, you know, just like flipping the classroom and saying, okay, well, read the you know the grammar rules at home, or take these ten sentences and you know inductively um, you know figure out the rules based on this, and then we'll talk about it tomorrow. It's it, it's more difficult. But there, there really is um, a purpose, again, whether you want to call it uh, task-based learning or, or project work or something like that, but making more time in the classroom for uh, exploration and um, processing or synthesis. Um, like, well, exactly like Dave said, where you, know, you have to read To Kill a Mockingbird so that you can discuss it and figure out what it means. Um, and uh, that's what I'd like to figure out how to bring into the class. You know, what can we get them to? What is the heavy lifting that we can get them to do, so that we can then, you know, <coughs> get them to process something together? What one of the things that I've been doing is I I I've learned that I ask Socratic questions, and I say, why should I be the person who? the only person who knows how to ask questions. So I take some time to teach them, and actually in class, teach them how to ask questions, which stops the Ferris Bueller's, you know, the teacher, anybody, 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 you know, and uh, with that boredom. So I actually have them go through and ask different, you know, who, what, when, where, why, how, or some form of things, and then so far, anyway, this is kind of new, that develops their inquisitiveness and perhaps their critical thinking skills. And it doesn't have to be Socratic. It can be on a little bit more focused on the topic. So um, I don't see why only uh, instructors should have that 
available. I think every child should have at least know how to ask questions. Uh, in a whole series of them, in the who, in the what, in the when, in the where, in the why, in the how, in whatever language. It's important to make them inquisitive because I'm trying to prepare them for the future and not the past. So it's like the past is kind of irrelevant to me. Um, my, own, my own approach and, and to address Marlena's and, and then also Ben's point, point or questions really um, ELT, we really do have to modify this model. I think the flipped classroom is really good for um, content-based kind of subject-based teaching where the teacher is actually instructing knowledge. But language is not a knowledge unless you really um, have a real grammar focus in your classroom. Um, and that could be an exception. Um, but if, you know, in the typical communicative language teaching classroom, we're not really focused on teaching aspects of language. We're really focused on communicating. Um, so with ELT, we really have to modify it. And, and I take the approach of um, language takes a lot of practice. And the students don't get enough time in the classroom to do it. And that's been the major stumbling point across decades of the classroom, the weakness of the language classroom. We just don't give students enough chance, um, enough time on task to achieve uh, fluency and to make large amounts of progress <clears throat> quickly. So the flipped classroom offers a practice area for students to practice on their own, outside of the classroom, um, what, uh, what we were doing within the classroom as an instructor. So it could be as simple as that, that um, say you're practicing past simple verbs. The student at home is uh, to do activities and watch videos and to get knowledge of the past forms, um, you know, it, 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 um, and how to do e endings and uh, irregular forms. Then when they come to the classroom, they apply it. And it's for the teacher to, to really um, bring them together to apply it in a social context. So that, you know, language needs that social layer. Um, so, but it takes a lot of preparation because you have to tell them what to do to prepare for the class, what rote learning they need to do um, online to prepare for the class. And I think that could be, you know, many forms as we already discussed. But Basically, for language, it's giving students a chance to practice on their own, and um, you know, to, to take down their effective filter, which they can do offline, also, online. You know, I'd like to add to that. This format, you'll notice that we're we're switching back and forth every two minutes. I apologize; it went to about four minutes. So when I do this format, go ahead. It's your turn. It's your turn. It's your turn. And I let them know ahead of time that it will be their chance to express themselves in the context of the uh, If I can add, yes, uh, sorry. Um, yes, I, I think that what David was saying is very good because uh, what happens in classes, well, I, I usually have mixed ability classes. So uh, I've got students uh, who get it very quickly and others who need more. Uh, uh, more practice, as we were saying. So yes, uh, I think this could be a good way of applying the flip class in the language classroom because uh, a language has got to be spoken to be practiced. And uh, um, so, if I uh, spend too much time in class during grammar exercises to uh, practice the ED and then, as you were saying, for the past tenses. Then some uh, some students will be put off completely because they say, "Well, we know that for reading, we don't need to do that." But if I can give this as a extra practice at home, that would be that would work eventually. And in class, we can do like uh, narrate something in the past tense altogether, and also the weakest students can take part in it. If, if we take this approach, I'd like to add something to Dave's point as well, is if we're looking at the flipped classroom in the English language, well, the language classroom in general, um, 
then it seems to me that we're looking at teaching grammar covertly or implicitly. And um, I, I think focusing more on communication in general, this is definitely something that we need to try to find ways of doing. Um, but I, I wonder um, if, we're, if we have a mixed level or mixed abilities classroom, which I would say that most of us have, and I think that's pretty common, um, then wouldn't it be necessary at some point for some learners who aren't really capturing the grammar needed to be able to participate or communicate in the class, they would need that direct instruction in class, they would need that explicit explanation of the grammar uh, in some cases. I mean, is that a possibility? Um, and, you know, and then are we modifying this idea of flip? I mean, is it all or nothing type of a concept here or are, are we dealing with shades of gray? And, um, you know, we haven't mentioned, too, that some students ha don't have access or easy access to technology, then which makes makes it a different or an additional challenge to being able to access information uh, outside of class. Um, so I, I don't know if anyone has thoughts or experiences with that, uh, with the mixed abilities of class, uh, class and also students who may or may not have access or easy access to technology. What's the role of grammar teaching and this idea of a flipped classroom? I, I do have, I, I use a bell-shaped curve and then my objectives are to move both ends forward. Uh, the most challenged student, as long as they move a little bit forward uh, on the line, as well as the most advanced, as long as they have the opportunity. I don't teach to the average, so I just use that uh, bell-shaped curve to, in, my, in my thinking. I don't know if I'm right, but it seems to work. Um, just and just quickly to your point about um, technology, I, um, I think that's a really valid point and one of the weaknesses, and along with a few others. Um, how I'd like to address that is that I don't think we should be giving um, homework. I disagree with that model of uh, students already have a lot to do, and they have busy lives, and of course. You know, we're trying to push them to be self-directed learners, but I don't agree with giving homework. I think the flipped classroom model should be done within the school uh, week or semester or day, meaning that if you have three classes a week with students, why can't two of them be done with bring your own device or in a language lab and one of them done with a teacher in the classroom? I think that's the best use of time, and then all all students get use get access to technology. Well, I, I uh, to that topic, I use uh, Mahali Csikszentmihalyi's positive uh, uh, psychology methods. He was a good professor, and and I enjoyed him. But uh, some students become more engaged, and they can't stop. Uh, and the analogy that probably works best is, uh, what do you do with a painter who continues to paint? And uh, because they're so highly engaged and after three days they fall down because they forgot to eat and some students become internally yes I want to do more and more and more um, and so that I, you know I want to give them the opportunity to do so yeah I was um, I just like I'm to sorry say go ahead Ben about the homework I mean yeah, it's it shouldn't be visit work, busy work, of course. But um, it, so far, that seems to be the the main way that's that. As as I'm learning uh, German, I'm studying German now, and um, you know, a, a lot of my processing time is when I'm doing my homework. It's um, you know, I I need this personal time, and I need some kind of a push. Um, here or there to you know to focus on this point or focus on on that point or you know study this vocabulary. So I mean, it, if you have three classes a week, that's uh, you know a lot more than than I have with some of my students. So um, you know, it it depends on the on the class, of course, as 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 everything does in the group and the time. Um, but I you know I. Yeah, I agree that homework as you know a chore is not a good thing, but but it it can be a good thing. 
Um, Dave mentions in the chat about, and, and Ben also about the idea of blended learning. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the flipped classroom definitely is a blended le learning classroom, but I, I would also say perhaps blend, all learning, blended learning situations aren't necessarily being flipped. Would, would you agree? I agree. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm just curious, again, going back to the idea of grammar and just trying to reconcile this in my mind here is, um, would you agree that, I mean, I guess there's, again, shades of gray here where I guess there are cases where you would have to uh, explicitly teach grammar. I'm just thinking the cases where you're, you've set up a dynamic activity, some sort of communicative uh, activity in class and there are students who aren't getting it or at least aren't able to do the activity and there's that moment where they're asking for some grammar explanation and, I, and I'm assuming most of us would agree that then we would uh, change hats there and, and, and explicitly cover a grammar point. Would you agree? I mean is that, is that a, putting it kind of in a practical sense that you know the uh, that there is room for ex explicit grammar, or do you think that it's better just to flip it in the sense that all grammar instruction should be done outside of class, and and all uh, activities within the class should be concentrated only on communicative activities? I think uh, I think that uh, well, this is my students. My students live in Italy. They have very little chances of speaking the language, speak English. So uh, the class is the only time when they can act, actually speak, speak the language. So you can't spend too much time in class teaching the grammar and having them uh, do grammar exercises. They won't speak the language at all. You've only got three hours a week where they can have, uh, where they can speak English. So I tend to. Um, um, have the grammar as uh, well as a flip the moment. I mean, they can do it at home. I just uh, point at something if there is, uh, if, if I need to, if there is something that is uh, facial or different from usual. But I must <coughs> say that uh, at basic level, particularly for Italian students, English grammar is quite easy. It's not very difficult. Uh, so, uh, Oh, I think it is uh, something different from German grammar. German grammar would be more difficult and would need more time in class, maybe. But I tend to teach uh, English grammar mainly at home with exercise. They can do it by themselves. And if they do it like quizzes, I can I can uh, check that they did it right and I can see if, if they have problems. And then I can go back to the problems just to uh, point at the problem that they show. And uh, in the class, spend more time on speaking and talking about different things. Yeah, I, um, I like your approach, definitely. Um, using the class time for authentic communication and speaking, or, you know, if it was a writing class, it would be about writing and spending that time to use writing as a communicative tool. And the learning what students learn so they can authentically communicate should be done in, in a self-directed fashion. What the students have to do to learn, but then when they apply it and then they try to communicate authentically, that's the skill of the teacher bringing the students together in the classroom um, to organize those activities that would best allow them, whether it be tasks or whether it be um, some simple um, learning activities like listening, um, etc. But the teacher uses their skills to bring students into a situation in the classroom where they're authentically communicating and using that um, knowledge that they learned by on their own. Okay, um, I've got a question for everyone. Taking this example of a writing class for English lang or language learners, what would be considered more uh, of a flipped approach, having them write in class and working with them as they write in class or, and then providing feedback outside of class or vice versa, have them actually do most of the writing outside of class and then spend more time in class going over and, re and 
discussing uh, uh, different uh, errors or mistakes. Well, if I can say my, my approach in this, uh, well, uh, if I give a writing task outside the class, they would mo most probably do it uh, using Google uh, Translator. And uh, <laughs> or uh, or using someone who knows English better, so I tend to give it in the class. <laughs> I don't know what is the situation in other countries, but in Italy it works like this. <laughs> if I give something to write at home, uh, it turns out to be a Google Translator <laughs> thing that comes to me, and I can see it because they make uh, silly mistakes. <laughs> to to your point, uh, Marlene, I'm not a, a, I speak English only. However, in the back screen. Hola, mi nombre es Rob. How did I do? Okay. Or maybe I should say Spanish. In the, maybe I should go to uh, German. Uh, into uh, German. Hola, my name is Rob. How did I do? <laughs> Great. So maybe, a bit I ask that, yeah. maybe I should ask <laughs> that. Uh, how did I do. We have each zoom tune. Not very good. <laughs> Would you help correct? <laughs> the children have tools, and it's not like we're going to, uh, you know, I don't know. So I give them if they if they have the tools. And David, to your point, not everyone has the tools. Oh yes, but they have got uh, older sisters and cousins <laughs> and other stuff they can ask if they, if I give the right um, And Marlena, just to your point, I think it w you make a great point, uh, and that's why I don't really. Um, I'm I'm in the Alfie Cohn kind of kind of. I I really don't like the guy, and uh, he bug rubs me the wrong way. But he he pushes this whole notion that you know homework is anthema. And we should never do it. But um, to to your point, I really like that. Um, you know, they're doing it in class. Um, you you know they're doing the work. Um, there's no fudging. But you could flip it by having them do reading outside of the classroom. Reading and, sure. and writing are very linked. Um, great writers are are readers, and that's how we learn to write. Um, so that would be one way to to flip that. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, initially when they have to write something, I try and uh, uh, take like a, uh, a model that they can follow. So this is this actually looking at the model and see how it works and what type of writing that is. Uh, for instance, the linkers they use in each paragraph and how paragraphs are built one after the other, the sequence and so on. Yes, they can do that definitely at all. Yeah, and checking in the classroom that they did that work, so that you know students yeah. know that um, what you ask them to do outside the classroom is valued. I think that's yeah. re really important. Concerning, concerning homework, uh, my point is always uh, I have to give the homework. I can then check in class. Good. Uh, I'm not yeah. going to give anything that I then can, cannot check. In class. I think that's a rule all teachers should have. Yeah. Because otherwise it's pointless to them and they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. It's no point in doing it, she's not checking. How do you I mean how do you give enough attention to the the writing of each student in your class though? I have um you know, if I have a class of eleven or twelve upper intermediate B two or, <laughs> or even C one students I mean, I just can't address. I, c I can barely address two or three students' uh, papers fully with them and their questions um, you know, during the, the class time. So you know, I, don't, I don't know if I can give them the, the kind of feedback that they need um, in that class. Um, I apologize because I have to go uh, to, to a different webinar, uh, actually. But uh, has anyone tried um, assigning speaking outside of class? You know, you can you can flip the classroom that way as well, mm -hmm. and have the, your students 
record things um, for you. It's just a uh, like an audio diary or, or something like that, and give them give them more more speaking class or more speaking time uh, outside of class. I I used this uh, Vakaru um, thing before, uh, but yet yeah, live Mocha. Uh, I've I've done or there's some um, yeah there's there's a few conversation exchange uh, places yeah I I used to do workshops on that point about speaking online um, using everything from uh, what you just mentioned simple recorders to sending emails and recording to uh, you know things like screencasts and and other things um, I'll do a self plug I'm the uh, director of education for English Central. So um, that's something you know we I've built specifically in mind for this kind of model, giving students extra practice speaking offline or out of the classroom. I mean. So yeah, your point's great. Um, there are things they can do outside the classroom that still address the need to, to practice speaking. I do a, a, maybe a different variety of that. I bring in experts into the class. To talk to speak live, or Skype in experts. Yeah. I, I I enjoy this because uh, yeah, there's yeah you can Skype in. I used to use that. I just find that this is a little bit more engaging because the students have control and they can also screen share and uh, and say what is the meaning of this, and so they have more tools available to them rather than being defenseless. I can. Say what is the meaning of this, and then speak to it. Okay, uh, we're we're getting close to an hour here, and I don't want to take up any more of your time. Are there any closing comments or thoughts, or even questions uh, that we might throw out here at, uh, as we sum up? Well, well maybe we could find a way of continuing this discussion uh, outside this time now. If there is a place where we can where we can continue and discuss and ask questions, I I just like to thank everybody. I, I, David, a uh, very good question. I think that your beginning, your opening was, uh, I think that the, the flipped uh, the flipped classroom uh, lacks a clear definition, and I'm not sure that it should have a good definition because it's rather in, it should be innovated at this time, perhaps. Uh, but uh, you yeah. know, it's a great uh, topic to get maybe some kind of a better understanding of what it is, and that's probably very important. You know, in all problem solving, they say let's define the problem. Yeah, and perhaps we can schedule future hangouts in the future where we get more practical and start sharing maybe experiences and and, and practical examples of what a flipped classroom might look in the language learning classroom. I, I for one, would find that interesting to see what others are doing. And uh, and seeing you know what's working and what's not, and uh, how others are using technology to really uh, change this. In some cases, this cultural shift, uh, as I see it, in some cases where where the teacher is taking more of a facilitative role. Um, okay, any other final comments? Yeah, no, I, I second that. Practical examples would be good, Benjamin. And I'll just leave us from my my perspective. For me, it's all about using the students' time wisely. Um, too often, we've sat in classrooms ourselves and just been bored stiff. And I think this whole movement, whether it be flipped classrooms, self-directed learning, online learning, um, e-teaching, is about using students' time wisely <clears throat> and allowing for differentiation that uh, technologies do allow us so that students are not wasting their time in our classrooms. Yeah, I second that. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and close it up. This session has been recorded. I'm using uh, Camtasia to record here locally. It's not being broadcast on 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 air. Perhaps in the future we could uh, offer an on air event. But I will be uploading this to YouTube, and I will be posting the link in the event. Um, hopefully everyone has access to the event that was created for this Hangout. Um, and does, every, does everyone have that link? Just so you have access to the uh, recording in YouTube? 
Um, so feel free to share this, uh, this information, and hopefully we can uh, meet again in the future, in the near future, to talk uh, more about uh, the flipped classroom in language learning. I want to thank everyone for participating. Thanks to those who are watching this video. And uh, bye for now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Wait, wait, wait. And in German? And in German? Uh, uh, Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen, yeah. Auf Wiedersehen. Oh, Google Translate failed. Bye. Bye. <laughs> okay, bye.